Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Eric Womwell. I'm a clinical assistant professor at UMKC School of Pharmacy and a clinical pharmacy specialist here at Centerpoint Medical Center. I'm joined today by uh, two students that are with me from the pharmacy school, Erica and Justin. Uh, they've been with me for the past few weeks and one of the things that we've been looking at is uh, nitrofurantoin, specifically the fact that it's listed as a beer criteria medication. It's the only anti-infective listed on the beers list, which is a list of medications that may be inappropriate for use in the geriatric population uh, because uh, potentially it makes uh, that population more prone to side effects or can cause other uh, ailments. Uh, the reason that nitrofurantoin is listed on the beers list has to do more so with its efficacy. And uh, so we felt it would be important for us to review uh, what, where is that data coming from? Uh, is it pertinent to current uh, patients, to current clinical practice? And, and I think it's important to first talk about nitrofurantoin is really specifically utilized for urinary tract infections for treatment. Uh, we utilize it for a five-day course. And then it can also be utilized for prophylaxis up to six months for prophylaxis. That's a low dose daily. Uh, the drug uh, gets uh, levels throughout uh, the body, uh, but it specifically exerts its action within the urine because it's dependent upon being in the urine, uh, being near the bacteria in order for it to become active and then exert its antibacterial uh, antiseptic effect on those bacteria. Otherwise, it's metabolized within the tissues of uh, the body. And so having said all of that, uh, I'm first going to throw it over to Justin here, who's going to talk a little bit about efficacy, uh, renal clearance of the drug within the elderly population. All right, so nitrofurantoin actually made its way onto the beers list after a couple studies in the 1960s. Uh, basically, they showed it reached inadequate concentrations in the urine in renally impaired patients. Um, this can lead to treatment failure, as Dr. Walmall just mentioned. Um, Thus, it's currently contraindicated to use in patients with a creatinine clearance less than 60 milliliters per minute. Um, you know, elderly patients may be more likely to be renally impaired, and thus we find it on the beers list. Um, so let's just dig into some of the literature. Uh, one of those original trials from the 1960s published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1968, the effect of renal function on urinary recovery of orally administered nitrofurantoin. Uh, this study basically aimed to determine the relationship between the degree of renal impairment and how much nitrofurantoin was recovered in the urine. Uh, they didn't actually state the number of patients in the trial, but it was a relatively small trial based on the graphs and the results. We can see 36 plots, um, so roughly 18 samples from a group below creatinine clearance of 60 milliliters per minute and 18 in the normal renal function group. Uh, the study was based on just a single dose of 100 milligrams of nitrofurantoin. Urine samples were collected at four different times uh, before administration of the drug, and then from zero to two hours post dose, or two to two to four hours post dose, and from four to ten hours post dose. Um, they measured creatinine based on a couple non-standard methods today. Uh, creatinine was measured by a method of Fallen and Wu. Uh, basically, they mixed the sample with an alkaline solution and then compared the resulting color with known standard solutions of creatinine. Um, probably not as sensitive or as accurate as today, but we don't really know for sure how that would compare to the standard of practice today. Um, as far as creatinine clearance then calculated from that, um, they did a standard formula with, without correction for body surface area. So again, probably not the standard we use today, not sure how it compares. Um, but. Anyway, as far as the results go, during the first two hours of collection, patients with a creatinine clearance less than 60 mils per minute excreted very little drug. After four hours, the excretion was more complete, but patients with less than 20 milliliter per minute creatinine clearance uh, still excreted very little. And then after the full 10 hours of the study, um, the relationship between creatinine clearance and the uh, recovery of nitrofurantoin was actually almost linear but the patients with creatinine clearance less than 20 still had excreted very little nitrofurantoin. Uh, then they plotted actually the maximum concentration seen at any time during the collection against the renal function, and they also superimposed the various MICs of some common urinary bacteria onto the graph. 
and based on this they kind of this is where the um, they concluded that the concentrations were, inad were inadequate in patients with creatinine clearance less than 60 mLs per minute. Um, so obviously uh, the study had a variety of major limitations uh, just to review some of them here. Very small population size, um, less than 40 patients, 36 um, roughly. Um, creatinine and creatinine clearance calculations were performed in a non-standard manner as of today. Um, the maximum urine concentrations were based on a single dose. So, you know, we're using a five-day course, multiple doses. So a multiple dose regimen probably would achieve higher urine concentrations. And then fourth and potentially the most important, uh, this was just a pharmacokinetic study. They didn't really study the clinical efficacy or the cure rate. Um, so, and the authors used the failure to achieve clinical efficacy in support of their conclusion for contraindications. So without that data, it's hard to use that to support your conclusion. So I'll jump in real quick. So the reason that this study is important is one, etrofranitoin's efficacy is dependent upon it actually getting into the urine. And so as that creatinine clearance decreased, there was less of the drug recovered in the urine, which would make us think that it could potentially be not as clinically effective. But again, this trial didn't look at clinical outcomes. It merely superimposed MICs yes. on top of the concentration. So really, so it would really be doing some major jumps and, and making some assumptions there based on those results. That's correct. Okay. Um, a second article we looked at um, it's titled, A Retrospective Review Assessing the Efficacy and Safety of Nitrofurantone in Renal Impairment. Uh, this was published in the Canadian Pharmacist Journal in 2009, so much more recently. Um, and unlike our last study, the primary outcome in this one was cure, uh, whether that be clinical or microbiological cure. And by that, um, they mean that clinical cure rate was defined as uh, treatment discontinuation after an appropriate course of therapy with nitrofurantone. Uh, combined with absence of symptoms and no additional UTI antibiotics used in the following 14 days after therapy. Um, microbiological cure, on the other hand, was just a confirmed negative culture afterwards. Um, and so this study was retrospective. It looked at patient medical records. Um, two of the important criteria for their inclusion criteria that I thought were uh, kind of limitations. Uh, UTI was only suspected, it wasn't actually confirmed, so if they didn't confirm UTI, our cure rates might not be 100% accurate, um, as well as they had an inclusion criteria for hospitalization was required for 14 days after completion of antibiotic therapy. Uh, obviously that's going to, um, I guess, exclude a majority of our population. Not a ton of people are going to stay for 14 days in the hospital after completing their antibiotic therapy. Um, and then just as far as the statistics go, there's 400 patients, um, they had calculated to need 80% power, they only actually reviewed 356 charts. Uh, creatinine clearance was calculated using a modified cockcroft galt equation, but they did standardize it for a 72 kilogram body weight. So there's another limitation there, um, standardized body weight, you know, uh, a lot of the populations are obese or... Um, you know, we just can't standardize a body weight like that. So, and based on this calculation, patients with creatinine clearance below 15 milliliters per minute were considered to be renally impaired. So our two groups were based off of the above 50 and below 50 milliliters per minute uh, concentration or creatinine clearance. Um, and results between these two groups actually showed similar cure rates. Um, the renally impaired group had 71% cure, while the normal renal function group had 78% cure. So. Um, they actually studied the secondary outcome of adverse events. Uh, they only really looked at GI disturbances and, and headache, as these were the most common uh, side effects, and they were 7 and 8% respectively. Due to the low sample size and low incidence, they didn't really go into statistics with those. But uh, again, uh, this study had major limitations. Uh, it did not meet power. It was retrospective in nature, so obviously we might not have the adequate, accurate documentation um, we're not perfect, so we don't always document everything like we're supposed to. Um, and then the average creatinine clearance in the renally impaired group was actually estimated to be 40 milliliters per minute. So is this data really generalizable to patients with more severe renal impairment? And then again, that UTI was only suspected, not confirmed, so our cure rates might not be accurate. And those are some of the big limitations of this study.
but it does contradict this the uh, the results from the last study that we had mentioned. So that's interesting. And then one last uh, article that we're going to look at today was published in the Annals of Pharmacotherapy in 2013. Uh, it was titled "Nitrofurantoin Contraindication in Patients with a Creatinine Clearance Below 60 Mls Per Minute: Looking for the Evidence." Uh, this was a literature review. It looked at the two trials I previously mentioned, as well as a few others, so we're just going to highlight the main points of those real quick. Uh, first, there's an article from 1967 from the Transactions of the American Association of Genitourinary Surgeons, uh, titled Bacteriuria and Chronic Renal Disease. In this study, patients received uh, multiple repeated doses of 100 milligrams of nitrofurantoin. Urine was collected for 24 hours in this study and plotted. Um, against renal function. In PLOTS again, they showed actually in this study that creatinine clearance of 30 to 40 and patients with creatinine clearance of 60 to 110 actually showed similar amounts of nitrofurantoin in their urine. So um, limitations of this would be again a small sample size. They said they only had 10 patients with renal impairment in this study and again they did not measure clinical efficacy or cure rate in this study. So but um, another study potentially um, concluding evidence against the contraindication. Um, another study from 1958, um, as you can see a lot of these studies are really, really old, um, Journal of Urology uh, titled The Theory Concerning Urinary Infection and Prolonged Administration of Nitrofurantoin for Prevention. This looked at patients with pyelonephritis and they received nitrofurantoin four times a day for at least one week. Um, only 17 participants were in the study and they looked at urinary concentrations. They had a goal urinary concentration of five to 10 milligrams per deciliter. Um, the renally impaired group achieved a concentration of two milligrams per deciliter, while the normal renal function group achieved a concentration of 11 milligrams per deciliter. So there was a significant difference seen between the two groups in this study. Um, again, a very small sample size and cure rate clinical efficacy was not evaluated, so some limitations here again. And then the last trial I'm going to talk about uh, was titled The Neural, Hematologic, and Bacteriologic Effects of Nitrofurantoin and Renal Insufficiency. This was published in the American Journal of Medicine in 1971. Uh, this trial actually had two phases. The first phase was a urine concentration uh, test. Uh, they had a goal concentration of 2.5 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter, and this was just after one single 100 milligram dose. And in this study, all but one patient in the normal renal function group achieved the goal concentration, and only one patient in the uh, renally impaired group achieved the goal concentration. But this patient actually was stated to have been an elderly patient with approximately a creatinine clearance of 95 mils per minute, so I'm not really sure why they were in the renally impaired group, uh, but it is what it is, I guess. Uh, so in, this, those, in that first phase, uh, you can see a significant difference between the normal renal function group and the renally impaired group. As far as the second phase, though, they only looked at nine renally impaired patients, and they only assessed clinical cure. Uh, and actually, six patients achieved clinical cure, including four patients who did not reach their goal concentration in phase one. So that's interesting, um, but of the three patients who failed, only one of them was actually infected with E. coli. The other two were infected with Proteus species, which we know to be insensitive to nitrofurantoin. So really only one of those actually failed as far as cure rate goes. So another suggestion or conclusion supporting um, potentially evidence that goes against the contraindication. Um, so after looking at all this evidence, we find lots of trials lots of major limitations in the trials, and lots of conflicting conclusions. So I think it's, uh, I mean, the evidence kind of supports um, that there's a, the contraindication with a creatinine clearance less than 60 mils per minute is questionable. Um, I think we really need to go with some further investigation with prospective trials and look at urinary concentrations and clinical efficacy outcomes uh, a little farther before we say it's ineffective in these patients. Sure. So, uh, again, kind of just reiterating or re-summarizing what you said, um, when we look at the kinetic data, 
as chronic clearance decreases, certainly renal excretion and renal concentrations of nitrofurantoin then goes down, uh, which then would uh, give us suspicion or concern about its efficacy in those states. However, when we look specifically at the clinical cure data, uh, there seems to be still substantial evidence that we achieve enough concentration with nitrofurantoin to provide a clinical cure in patients with uh, reduced renal function and creatinine clearances less than 60. The furthest down it looked like that we went was a 40 mm -hmm. creatinine clearance. And so looking at uh, people between 40 and 60 and saying, yeah, we could potentially continue to use creatinine clearance in those individuals based on that clinical outcome data. But I think it's important to note that all these data points are specific to creatinine clearance. It has nothing to do with age, right? Right. And so to have a, a criteria that comes out and says we can't use nitrofurantoin in an elderly population because it's not going to be effective is kind of a, a misstatement, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, unless their creatinine clearance is substantially reduced, then that makes sense. But otherwise, just overall making a broad broad-based recommendation not to use nitrofurantoin in this population is a little short-sighted, particularly because nitrofurantoin continues to be highly effective for a broad range of pathogens specific to um, the urinary tract. So, okay, good, good. Now, the other key point here to look at it was you had one study that looked at adverse uh, effects of nitrofurantoin, and I think this is what a lot of people get confused about with why nitrofurantoin is not recommended in the elderly population or why it's on the beers list. It is not on the beers list because of toxicity or side effects. Really, the most common side effect that we see is this GI disturbance due to its absorption uh, through the GI tract. Um, so, uh, I guess just to provide a little bit more information about nitrofurantoin and the toxicities, Erica took a look at um, of some of these of the toxicities, yeah. yeah. So, what do you have for us? All right. So, um, as many of you guys should um, might already know, nitrofurantoin is a synthetic nitrofurant antimicrobial agent that's been used for more than 50 years to treat UTIs. Um, serious adverse effects associated with their therapy have been reported, such as hepatic toxicity, pulmonary toxicity, and even neural uh, peripheral neuropathy. So, today I'm going to be going over the three rare but serious side effects associated with nitrofurantoin use. So the first one I'm going to get going into is hepatotoxicity. So nitrofurantoin is one of the most common causes of drug-induced liver disease and can cause either an acute or chronic hepatitis-like syndrome that can lead to liver failure or cirrhosis. My first article was a review article that looked at nitrofurantoin-induced hepatotoxicity. So what they found um, was that a broad spectrum of liver toxicity associated with nitrofurantoin range from acute hepatitis, granulomatous reaction, cholestasis, or autoimmune-mediated hepatitis to chronic active hepatitis that can all lead to cirrhosis or death. Um, the acute form is typically associated, associated with one or two week courses of treatment with nitrofurantoin and is usually really rare, about 0.3 cases per 100,000 prescriptions. The uh, acute liver injury typically presents within a few weeks of starting nitrofurantoin and can arise up to a few weeks after stopping at the defined, cor defined course of treatment. Uh, the pattern of liver injury is usually hepatocellular with or without jaundice and can um, Uh, and typically is accompanied by symptoms of fever and rash. Um, the acute injury due to nitrofurantoin re usually resolves rapidly once the medication is stopped, but um, severe and fatal instances have been reported in some cases. Uh, the chronic form is more common and than the acute form and typically presents months to years after initiation of long-term prophylactic therapy. The estimated incidence of liver injury from nitrofurantoin is approximately 1 per 1,500 people exposed. The presentation is usually gradual and marked initially uh, by fatigue and weakness, followed by dark urine and jaundice. There is marked elevation in serum ALT levels, increases in gamma globulin levels, and the presence of anti-nuclear and anti-smooth muscle antibodies. So it's also important to note that in some instances, the onset is abrupt and resemble acute hepatitis. Um, so it's really important to uh, identify acute or the chronic form. So uh, now the mechanism of injury is not really well known, 
Uh, studies have shown its nitroreductive metabolism produces injurious oxidative free radicals, which can damage hepatocytes. Uh, a study by Kelly et al. suggested that CD8 cytotoxic T cells play a vital role in the pathogenesis of nitroferritin induced liver damage. And this is seen by an uh, uh, experiment that they did um, where they observed or they stained lymphocyte infiltrates around the areas of necrosis and what they found is an abundance of CD8 T cells in that area. Now another proposed mechanism for injury is through a nitroreductive metabolism. Nitroferritin undergoes cyclic uh, oxidation reduction in the cell so that in anaerobic conditions it forms an anion, anion free radical and in aerobic conditions it reoxidizes and generates oxidative free radicals. Now these free radicals result in damage to the liver cells uh, by producing massive oxidative stress in the cells. It is unclear whether reduced renal function predisposes patients to hepatic injury. However, risk factors that we're seeing are advanced age, um, and advanced age, um, often people who have uh, reduced renal function, length, length of exposure greater than six months, and uh, female, being female. So another study by Homer et al. analyzed 921 reports of adverse reactions to nitroferritin. And uh, what they found was that 50 cases involved hepatotoxicity. Uh, of these patients, 76% were hospitalized and one death was associated with liver injury. Jaundice was noted in the initial presentation in 29 of the 50 patients. Uh, another study uh, by Strick et al. Stricker et al. analyzed 52 voluntary reports by clinicians of hepatotoxicity associated with furans. They found that a casual relation was likely in 38 out of the 52 cases. A liver injury was acute in 25 patients and chronic in 13 patients. A casual relation was unclassified in 10 patients because of lack of data, and then four patients, a casual relation was considered uh, unlikely. So um, in conclusion, the nitrofentroin is a rare Nitrofurantoin toxicity is rare and serious, and it's, it's a well-reported complication. Clinicians should weigh the risk and benefits of the drug being initiating therapy, and if long-term prophylaxis is warranted, then periodic monitoring assess and assessment should be made. So, um, next I'll go into my second article, which talks about pulmonary toxicity. So the second article was a retrospective study that looked into pulmonary toxicities caused by nitroferritin. So nitroferritin induced lung disease is relatively uncommon, occurring in less than 1% of patients receiving the drug. 85% of patients who present with nitroferritin associated uh, pulmonary reactions are women, which is highly, that's usually what we'd see because most women compared to men have UTIs and are prescribed nitroferritin. So um, the toxicity can present as acute, subacute, or chronic respiratory disease. Acute presentation is the most common clinical presentation and is found in about 83% 83, 83 of cases. Subacute presentation have more gradual onset of symptoms with most reported cases having received nitroferritin for periods ranging from one to six months. So chronic presentation is seen in patients on therapy ranging from six months to six years. Um, it's important to note that patients who present acutely are usually younger with a median age of 59 years compared to those with a chronic presentation with a median age of 68 years. Uh, so um, and looking at another article, um, it reviewed medical records of 18 patients with chronic nitroferritin induced lung disease who were seen at the Mayo Clinic and all patients were given nitroferritin with a median daily dose of 100 milligrams ranging from 50 to 200. The onset of symptoms occurred after a median duration of 23 months of therapy. All patients presented with respiratory symptoms and persistent lung infiltrates were detected on chest x-rays. The presenting symptoms included dyspnea, cough, and chest pain. So basically the study, these studies in general basically concluded that the chronic nitroferritin induced lung disease is seen primarily in older women who have been prescribed nitroferritin for the prevention of UTIs. Most patients with chronic nitroferritin induced lung disease will improve either by stopping the drug alone or by, um, or with corticosteroid therapy. Um, 
and it's unlikely that residual infiltrates uh, will persist long term in the lungs. So lastly, I'm on to my last article or topic of toxicity, peripheral nerve toxicity. Um, basically, there was really hard, it's not very common at all, and so it was really hard to find really good data on peripheral nerve toxicity. So um, I'm just going to be going over a case study that um, I found and um, looking over the, the patients and um, what they found with the case study. So uh, the third article looked at peripheral, to peripheral nerve toxic effects of nitroferritoin. Nitroferritoin neuro neuropathy man usually manifests as length-dependent sensory motor polyneuropathy. Varying degrees of motor weakness are found in the same pattern of distribution with muscle atrophy occurring in severe cases. Most patients had moderate to severe abnormal sensory and motor conduction on nerve conduction studies and axonal degeneration on nerve biopsies. The article looked at two patients. Both the patients were female and in their 50s um, with relatively short exposure to nitroferritoin. Um, that developed non-length dependent neuropathic pain. So what they found um, was that they found an unremarkable finding on clinical examinations and nerve conduction studies, but uh, when they did skin biopsies, they revealed abnormal distinctive morphological changes. Each patient had non-length dependent small fiber neuropathy or ganglionopathy. Um, the first patient presented with generalized body dis dysthesias, while the second patient had predominantly perineum symptoms with some subse subsequent involvement of the extremities. Um, the duration of exposure f was four weeks of prophylactic dose in the first patient and only one week of therapeutic dose in the second patient. Um, both patients had normal renal function, which is important to note. Despite uh, stopping the nitroferritoin, the symptoms actually progressed. The first patient had persistent symptoms, but improved very slowly. It took almost three years for um, all the symptoms to completely go away after dis discontinuing nitroferritoin. And a repeated skin biopsy six months later on the second patient uh, actually revealed no reduction of fiber density, which suggests axonal swelling associated with nitroferritoin may not be a sig assigned to further epidermal nerve fiber degeneration. So in conclusion, um, nitroferritoin neuropathy was present with a wide spectrum of manifestations, more commonly in large fiber sensory motor neuropathy and small fiber neuropathy versus the non-length dependent neuropathy, which is rarely described in neurotoxic neuropathy. So. Great. Yeah. So uh, just reviewing all of that a little bit, uh, these are the rare but severe reactions that um, uh, are more specific to nitrofantone, so we've got the hepatotoxicity, the pulmonary toxicity, and this peripheral neuropathy toxicity. Um, what I kind of gathered from the hepatic toxicity is that this is not particular to patients with renal dysfunction, or not particular to elderly. Um, those are populations at greater risk, uh, but this is still a complication that can happen in any patient. Uh, particularly, I think you said the median age was somewhere around 59-ish. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you can have those toxicities at, at, with any patient that we're looking at. And what, what was the overall rate of the hepatotoxicity? Did you have that as well? Was that the 0 0.3 or the 0 0.03? Oh, yeah, 0 0.3 cases per 100,000 prescriptions. Okay, so again, very, 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 yeah, very low. Very, very. Okay, and then the pulmonary toxicity, the pulmonary fibrosis, Again, these are, it seemed like 1%, very low, and particularly in patients that have been prolonged therapies, 6 to 18 months, I believe you said, um, 16 months, something along those lines. So uh, 6 months to a year and a half, which is not going to be typical for active treatment of a urinary tract right. infection. So there's going to be um, some different scenarios where we see that occur. And then rele relegated to case reports for peripheral neur neuropathy, so that definitely owes to the rarity of that toxicity. So taking this all together, uh, what I really want to emphasize to our, our, our listeners, our watchers here, is that natrofrantoin is still a very active drug for urinary tract infections. Uh, it's 
got BRE coverage, E. coli coverage, um, very strong drug, not a lot of resistance with it. Uh, it's dependent upon secretion into the urine, so there does need to be good, good renal function in order to it exert its efficacy. But we've got some data here that says you can push it down to a creatinine clearance of 40. And one of the main things to remember about UTIs is we know within two days whether or not the drug is working. So you can do a symptom check on the patient and say, how's your pain, how's your frequency, how's your dysuria, and know relatively quickly whether or not the patient's renal function is good enough uh, to provide a clinical cure, and then you can move to an alternative agent at that point. It's a relatively cheap drug, low side effect profile, um, GI intolerance, the primary side effect profile, and so please do not be afraid of nitrofrantoin. It's a good drug. Um, all right, I think that's all for today. Anything else that you guys had? Okay, I appreciate your time, and uh, we look forward to the next edition of these clinical scenario investigation afternoon sessions with Dr. Wamwa and students. See ya.